Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us at CHCI's Leadership Conference. I would like to welcome you to our session, Puerto Rico, Opening the Door to a Brighter Economic Future. My name is Yvette Maldonado, and I've been the Human Resources Director at CHCI for the past year. Being from Puerto Rico and having one of my sisters, parents, and many family members still living on the island, this session is very close to heart. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Amgen, T-Mobile, and the Transportation Institute for their generous support of this session. Before we begin our panel, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel host, Representative Raul Grijalva, and our moderator, Representative Darén Soto. Representative Raul Grijalva has represented Arizona's 3rd Congressional District since 2003. However, he has spent over four decades as a public servant. Throughout his career, he has always fought for underrepresented voices, fighting to implement bilingual education and revitalize older and poor neighborhoods in his state. As chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, Representative Grijalva is tasked with advancing the interests of residents of U.S. Air territories as well as the indigenous people of this country. This committee also considers legislation and oversees federal conservation and species protection programs. We will also hear from Sara Fuentes, Vice President of the Transportation Institute. The Transportation Institute works to ensure a strong U.S. flag merchant marine for economic and national security. This panel will bring together individuals who are working to address Puerto Rico's economic and humanitarian crisis. To help us moderate this timely discussion, we are delighted to have another STEAM member of the United States Congress and a close colleague of Representative Grijalvas, Representative Taren Soto. Representative Soto represents the 9th Congressional District in Central Florida. He is the first Floridian of Puerto Rican descent to serve in Congress. Since entering public service, he has succeeded in creating high-paying jobs and increasing access to higher education for his constituents. Representative Soto has been on the front lines leading the fight for Puerto Rico. Following Hurricane Maria, he eagerly pushed the federal government for disaster relief. He also works closely with the Puerto Rican government on numerous legislative plans that support victims and their families. We're all looking forward to what is sure to be an enlightening discussion. Don't forget to continue the conversation via social media using hashtag CHCIHHM20. First of all, let me thank the HCI uh, for this important opportunity of uh, having uh, the speakers that are before you uh, to talk about Puerto Rico and prioritizing Puerto Rico as a CACI uh, area and arena to discuss at the conference. Puerto Rico has got, is going through a 10 year economic recession and that has been brought about by major hurricanes. It was brought about by earthquakes, pandemic, and then a present administration that has uh, put severe restrictions on the relief that was granted by Congress to help Puerto Rico rebuild their infrastructure, and the need to invest in education, health, and human services. I, this I, unequal treatment of Puerto Rico when it comes to tax credits, whether it be ch child tax credit, whether it be federal incentive tax credits, uh, is unequal and needs to stop. Uh, the issue has always been on the, on the committee that I serve that has jurisdiction over, uh, on Puerto Rico, the Resource Committee is about equal treatment and equal access. And I think the people that are going to be here today, my 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 colleague uh, Darren Soto, who has been a, a strong advocate on the committee for that, and my and my good friend that I miss, uh, Luis Luis Gutierrez, uh, are, uh, can both speak to that issue well. The bottom line is, and this is why it's so important, CACI did this. The bottom line is that the people of Puerto Rico are citizens of this country. They have contributed not only in a military sense, but in every sense to, the, to this nation, this nation building of ours. And they need and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect as we treat any other citizen in this country. And I think you'll hear about that. You'll hear about the recovery. We're going to talk about the status going forward in, one, in, a, in a meeting soon. But nevertheless, I think what CACI highlighting Puerto Rico is very important. 
Uh, and as uh, as Latinos in this country, we all need to understand that if it's a fight for one, it's a fight for all. Hello, I'm Sada Fuentes with Transportation Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to advocating for America's maritime policy. As these great leaders consider Puerto Rico's economic future, the domestic maritime industry is ready to help open those doors. The domestic maritime industry is crucial to Puerto Rico's economic future and ensures Puerto Rican goods reach the mainland. With numerous weekly sailings to and from Florida, local businesses benefit from this dependable service and find significant cost savings. Thanks to this reliable, dedicated service between the mainland and the island, backhaul rates of goods from Puerto Rico benefit from some of the most competitively priced domestic shipping rates available and mainlanders get the benefit of enjoying Puerto Rican brands. We are thrilled to play a role in helping Puerto Rican companies export to the mainland and wish to see more of these products reach consumers in this growing market. U.S. Puerto Rican Maritime also provides economic benefits in the form of thousands of local family wage jobs in Puerto Rico. The American domestic carriers serving Puerto Rico all have substantial presence on the island, performing operational, seafaring, sales, maintenance, administrative, and other functions. And the unions are hiring now. These companies are also a part of the local fabric of the community. When most of the world had moved on, it was American maritime and American seafarers donating and distributing tents, supplies, water filtration systems, and more in the aftermath of Puerto Rico's natural disasters this year. The domestic maritime industry is part of the community in Puerto Rico. We will continue to support our people by opening the door to a greater economic future for Puerto Rico. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos to all of our attendees of the CHCI 2020 Leadership Conference. And welcome to our panel on Puerto Rico, opening the door to a brighter economic future. Good afternoon, my name is Darren Soto and I have the honor of representing Florida's 9th Congressional District in Central Florida. Uh, I'm of Puerto Rican descent and represent many of our brothers and sisters in Central Florida. I'm delighted to be here with so many friends from Puerto Rico to discuss its economic future. We have some of the greatest minds and greatest elected officials and leaders in the United States today on our panel. I want to thank Chairman Grijalva for his opening remarks and for setting a great tone for our conversation here. He's dedicated many hours to many challenges facing our island, and we're so very grateful for his leadership. And I want to thank you, our friends at CHCI, for hosting the Leadership Conference virtually so attendees from across the country and many from Puerto Rico can take part in this important conversation. Puerto Rico has one of the largest economies in Latin America, but is still struggling after several natural disasters and now the COVID-19 outbreak. Tens of billions of dollars in damage has reduced the island's gross domestic product by an astounding 8%. So in this session, we're going to look at what are the economic realities affecting Puerto Rico's recovery and discuss practical recommendations on revitalizing the economy and improving the socioeconomic conditions there. I'm joined by some of our extraordinary experts from the nonprofit business and policy arena to help shed light on this issue. Our first guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to do my best to do one anyway. And that's to welcome former U.S. Representative and current resident of Puerto Rico, Luis Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez represented Illinois' 4th Congressional District from 1993 to 2019 and saw so many changes and improvements and movements he fought for during that time period. And I've learned so much from him over the years. Next, we'll hear from Miguel Soto Paz, a president and founder for the Center for a New Economy. For 20 years, his organization has been generating ideas about improving the quality of life in Puerto Rico by producing actionable research and educating stakeholders 
on the most pressing and complex economic development problems facing the island. We'll also be joined by Esteban Santos, Executive Vice President of Operations for Amgen. Esteban is responsible for operations which encompasses manufacturing, process development, quality, engineering, and global supply chain for Amgen. We'll also hear from Jorge Martin. Vice President and General Manager of T-Mobile Puerto Rico. He is responsible for all functional areas, including marketing, sale, finance, customer service, human resources, IT and engineering. And we will hear from one of my other amazing mentors, another colleague of mine who needs no introduction, but we will do our best anyway to do so, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. She's the first Puerto Rican woman to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. She's been on the forefront of recover, recovery efforts in working to solve Puerto Rican debt, as well as promoting small businesses on the island as the chair of the Small Business Com Committee here in the Congress. Welcome, panel, and thank you for joining us. Before we get started, we're going to see a presentation by um, Mr. Santos uh, from Amgen, and then we're going to go uh, right into questions to our esteemed panel. Please proceed Thank with you. the Amgen slides. Thank you, Representative uh, Soto. Uh, it is my pleasure and I'm delighted to uh, be here joining you and the rest of the panelists to have a discussion about the future of Puerto Rico, something that is very dear and near to my heart. The slide that we're going to show uh, is just to provide uh, all the participants with a context of Amgen, the Amgen operations in Puerto Rico. As the representative Soto mentioned, uh, I am an executive vice president of global operations for Amgen. I have global responsibilities to ensure that we advance our innovative pipeline, as well as the manufacturing, quality, and supply aspects uh, for patients around the world. When I think about our operations globally, uh, and I think about our flagship operation, which you are seeing here in the picture, based out of Funcos, Puerto Rico, where we employ over 2,000 Amgen staff members and another 1,000 plus colleagues that provide services to ensure the smooth operation of that facility. A significant portion of the medicines that Amgen manufacture comes out of our six manufacturing complex operation in Juncos. This is a highly complex biomanufacturing operation. I could argue that it's probably the best the most sophisticated biomanufacturing operation in the world. And I'm pleased to say that it's in Puerto Rico, run by Puerto Rican scientists and engineers and various people with multiple expertises. What we manufacture there touches the lives of patients, not just in the United States, but in over 100 countries around the world. And again, I am very proud to say that Amgen has made these investments over the years to ensure that we have that capability locally and I will encourage all of us to think about how we preserve and then build from the base that companies like Amgen can provide. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Before we get started, I would like to invite our audience to submit any questions you have for our panelists in Q&A and comments in chat. Now let's jump into our first question. Uh, first, Our first question goes to Congresswoman Velasquez and let me thank you for your leadership over many years, Congresswoman, the mentorship that you provided to both myself and other legislators coming up through the ranks. And the question that uh, we uh, pose to you today is, Hurricanes Irma and Maria have left a lasting impact on the island. And now recent earthquakes and the pandemic have caused further damage to their fragile infrastructure and healthcare system. Can you speak to how Congress and nonprofits have risen to the occasion to help our brothers and sisters on the island? Okay, while we're dealing with this technical difficulty, and for that I apologize, Velasquez, we're going to continue on to uh, Esteban, BPO of Amgen, and as soon as we get her sound, we go right back to her. Uh, Esteban, can you speak to the recent challenges the manufacturing industry has faced with Puerto Rico's economy. And in that same vein, how do you think manufacturing can help Puerto Rico's reconstruction efforts after recent hurricanes, earthquakes, and now a pandemic? 
Thank you, Representative David Soto. I think that's, a, that's an important question for all of us to consider as we think about the future of Puerto Rico. Uh, there's a, an important context that we have addressed uh, in the early parts of this uh, session. Uh, certainly, the island has been in a significant and long uh, economic contraction. Uh, driven by multiple reasons, including changes in tax, tax policy uh, that has impacted some of the manufacturers on the island. The second part is there's something very specific to the biopharma industry, which is the famous patent cliff, where many of the products were manufactured in Puerto Rico over the years, lost patent exclusivity, turned generics, and then the manufacturing of those products went elsewhere. And lastly, certainly the impact of Hurricane Maria, and most recent, recently the, the earthquakes, are shaking the foundation of our infrastructure. Certainly, uh, uh, as, a, as a manufacturer based out of Juncos, we know what is to deal with a, a significant event like Hurricane Maria, where the eye of the storm of the hurricane just went through our manufacturing site. Uh, thankfully, because of the investments we made over many years, we were able to sustain our ability to supply. And because we have an amazing staff on the island with the technical capabilities, but also with the commitment, we were able to continue to deliver for patients. Now, as someone that uh, is in a position to uh, evaluate and decide on investments that get made in Puerto Rico or elsewhere, elsewhere I'd like to share with the audience uh, a couple of the considerations that people on my position will do as they're thinking about uh, future investments. There's three elements. First, strategic, then operational considerations, and lastly, financial considerations. From a strategic perspective, the first one is, do we have consistent policies that in the case of Puerto Rico, can balance the local needs with the federal needs. And are those po policies supplementary of each other or are they taking you know, situations that diverge? Also, uh, as important, it's, it's critical to maintain a ecosystem for the industry. The last thing that someone like me would like to have is uh, my Amgen operation in Puerto Rico to be an island within the island with a failing infrastructure and economy. I believe that we have been able to retain a core of biomanufacturing and medical device manufacturing on the island. Companies like Amgen, but not just Amgen, also Avi, Pfizer, J&J, Lilly, Medtronics, just to name, name a few, provide a core of a base where we can leverage and build from. Having an ecosystem is something that is important for all of us. It, it allows us for us to have the right talent and the investments in talent and also brings significant levels of jobs. Recent studies by the Biopharmaceutical Association show that around 80,000 jobs in Puerto Rico depend on the biopharma industry. And these jobs tend to pay three times and a half greater salaries than the average salary in Puerto Rico. So there's a significant level of importance to ensure the ecosystem remains, but also to build from there to ensure that the economy of Puerto Rico continues to improve. The second element will be around financial and operational considerations. And the operational considerations are, do we have an infrastructure that can sustain manufacturing? I need reliable power, water, and telecommunications to run a world-class facility. So investments in those areas are critical to ensure the competitiveness of Puerto Rico as a location for manufacturing. And also, we must continue to invest in our talent. As I mentioned, biomanufacturing is a very complex process requires significant levels of expertise. We're very fortunate that in our campus, about 80% of our 2,000 staff members have at least a college degree, and we have over 100 PhDs that support the smooth operations of that complex site. But we need to continue to invest to ensure that that talent is available, and when they graduate from our great schools in Puerto Rico, they have jobs where they stay on the island. And lastly, the financials. The tax policy is, is a critical enabler of investments in Puerto Rico. We need consistent policies, and as there's so many changes happening in the world, we need to ensure that as we discuss topics such as uh, made in the U.S. and uh, bringing biopharma back into the U.S., that we consider how we preserve the local the companies that are in Puerto Rico, and we ensure that we can attract more of those companies. There's a an opportunity for us to again build from the base that we have currently and hopefully attract additional business. And lastly, if I was going to step from that question, not from uh, my position as an executive in the industry, but as a Puerto Rican that wants to ensure the success of my island, I think that also we need to bring a culture of entrepreneurship. 
We need to ensure that we take advantage of those investments and we build the human and financial capital that is local, that ensures that we build local jobs that perhaps can compete in a global basis. And with that, I'll end my remarks and we can take Q&A later. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. And we appreciate the uh, commitment of Anjan to Puerto Rico. As you know, prior to Hurricane Maria, manufacturing is over 40% of the GDP of the island. Now it's over 50% because of unfortunate job losses in other areas. These are high paying jobs. We do recognize that we want, we encourage you to continue to keep them as high paying jobs. And I know we're working the Energy and Commerce Committee on establishing, uh, bringing back U.S. supply chains of drugs and uh, also medical devices. Uh, and uh, certainly we will have Puerto Rico in our hearts as we uh, look to having more U.S. domestic supply chains. We're thrilled uh, to now be able to return to Chairwoman Velasquez. I apologize about the uh, technical issues and uh, just for the benefit of our uh, audience, I'll repeat the question and then turn it over to the chairwoman. Her friends Irma and Maria have left a lasting impact on the island. And now recent earthquakes and the pandemic have caused further damage to their fragile infrastructure and healthcare systems. Can you speak to how Congress and nonprofits have risen to the occasion to help our brothers and sisters on the island, Chairwoman Velasco? Thank you, uh, Darren, and thank you, CACI, uh, for, for having this conversation that is so important for our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, but also uh, the Puerto Rican diaspora. Um, ever since Maria made downfall on the island back in September of 2017, Puerto Rico has not been able to catch a break. Uh, in fact, Puerto Ricans now must deal with multiple disasters at the same time. Unfortunately, the federal government, specifically the Trump administration, has failed to appropriately uh, respond to the need of Puerto Ricans. And therefore, uh, we members, including Congressman Soto and uh, AOC and some of the other uh, members, uh, Hispanic members, CHC, um, we have been putting pressure and uh, work in, within Congress to step up uh, the help uh, and the assistance that the people of Puerto Rico deserve. After Hurricane Maria, Congress appropriated $44.1 billion in emergency funds to help Puerto Rico recover and rebuild. And uh, most of that form of those funds had flowed through FEMA and the disaster relief uh, and the hot community development uh, block grant, CDBGDR. Out of that 40 billion, approximately $20.2 billion appropriated under CDBGDR, Puerto Rico only has the authority to use $3.2 billion, which is equal to 16% of the total funds and the Commonwealth has been classified by HUD as a slow spender. So Congress has to fight hard to address HUD's slow release of CTB GDR funds. I led two letters to Secretary Carson demanding for the release of those funds back in January of this year after the storm of earthquake struck the island. These earthquakes have devastated impact on the southwest side of the island. More than 1,500 uh, 150 houses have been destroyed and approximately 3,000 homes have suffered from some structural uh, damage. Congress moved quickly to respond to the emergency. And on February 2020, the House passed the Puerto Rico Earthquake Supplemental and this emergency supplemental provided $4.89 billion in emergency spending. The bill funds a broad range of disaster recovery activities, including educational needs, repairs to transportation infrastructure, community development, energy needs, and nutrition assistance. Unfortunately, like this happening now with the Hewitt Act, the Senate has refused to vote on this much needed 
piece of legislation. The pandemic is also wreaking havoc in Puerto Rico. There are more than 500 confirmed COVID deaths and more than 17 positive COVID-19 cases since the pandemic began. Through the CARES Act, Congress provided Puerto Rico with $2.2 billion in direct state help. Our job in Congress for helping Puerto Rico is always ongoing. But I have to recognize the work of everyday individuals that have stepped up to help the island in times of need. I will never forget that the day after the earthquake hit the south, there was traffic jam from the north side of the island made by individuals, companies, and nonprofits that packed their cars and drove them south to help their brothers and sisters. Puerto Ricans, they do not wait for anyone to come to help them. They know because they live through the response or the failed response by the federal government. And it should be that way. We need to make Puerto Rican fall after so much they have gone through in Puerto Rico. And uh, that is a continuing effort here in Congress to demand that the Puerto Rican brothers and sisters are made whole, that it is the responsibility of the federal government and the Trump administration and the federal agency to provide the assistance for us in Congress to protect the money. But that will not do any good if the Trump administration is putting every hurdle to prevent Puerto Rico from accessing that money. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Velasquez, for your uh, for everything you do, not only for your district back home in New York, but down on the island, and for taking the time to teach a lot of us who have gotten here uh, only recently over the last three or four years or two years, or uh, we're, we're going to have another uh, new member with Representative Torres for taking the time to go over the history and, and so many issues that are so important. So thank you for your leadership. Thank Next, we're going to hear. You bet. Next, we're going to hear from Jorge Martel, T-Mobile. You know, we already heard already from Mr. Santos the importance of telecommunications. Uh, serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, we've had many hearings on what worked and what broke down uh, after Hurricane Maria and how the industries uh, stepped up and made it more resilient, uh, as well as the importance in long-term uh, economic prosperity. Uh, so we appreciate Jorge you being here, and uh, look forward uh, to your comment. Hi, uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, an honor being part of the distinguished panel. Uh, yes, one of the few silver linings out of all the tragedies that uh, were uh, brought on by Maria was in terms of telecommunications. Uh, since T-Mobile, we were looking to rebuild our network. It was right at the time when 5G hardware technology was being developed and was ready. So a process that would have taken years uh, was only took a few months. And we were able to rebuild most of the network in Puerto Rico with 5G technology. So Puerto Rico at the moment uh, is at the leading edge of technology development worldwide, not only in the United States. It was about two years ago that I was in Representative Velasquez's office talking about the rebuilding process. And she asked me about Vieques, you know, the island, you know, to the east coast of Puerto Rico which was badly damaged and needs a lot of economic uh, uh, recovery and incentive. Well, I'm glad to say that all municipalities in Puerto Rico have areas with 5G, including Vieques and Culebra. Uh, why is this important? Uh, 5G is going to be the next milestone in terms of economic development. It's going to provide speeds that right now are only available uh, in people who have resources and offices in urban areas. It's going to provide this in rural areas. It's going to provide this at also economic levels. It's going to have impact given the speed, the lower latency in areas like manufacturing, uh, where we'll see immediately with the combination of IoT, being able to get data right at the moment, you know, so increase that, have higher outputs at lower cost. Agriculture, where people, agriculture will be able to actually look at the soil, the condiments of the soil, how to fix that, how to use drones to only go to a specific area. Tourism, uh, where you'll be able to have augmented reality, something that will be a key role in the future of tourism. 
and healthcare, among others. In healthcare, you'll be able to monitor, say, uh, blood sugar. Uh, you'll be able to uh, monitor your, your heart rate. Uh, you'll be able to provide a sophisticated monitoring that right now you would need to go to an emergency room. In an aging population that we'll have in Puerto Rico, we'll be able to do that you know, in rural areas. It's the infrastructure that will create self-driving cars uh, and many other areas. And more importantly, as Esteban alluded to, for us, it creates a framework, it creates an infrastructure, so we can have entrepreneurs from Puerto Rico. When 4G came around, uh, you had Uber uh, coming around, you had Airbnb, because you needed that type of data infrastructure. Well, now Puerto Rico will have the data infrastructure. Uh, so we'll have entrepreneurs ideally coming from Puerto Rico uh, to be able uh, to develop here, to create companies here, to create products and services that we can't even phantom right now, but they'll be able to provide uh, uh, the infrastructure. We're really committed to continue. We just had a merger with, with Sprint and we're putting our network assets and we'll be able to provide speeds that right now, again, few households in the United States, uh, let alone in Puerto Rico, currently happen again uh, in areas, in rural areas, et cetera. I'm gonna add a few things that Esteban mentioned as well. Uh, tax policy, it, it's, it's one that, uh, one of the few things that troubles me when I go back to our headquarters, uh, the, everybody in T-Mobile is crazy in Puerto Rico, crazy about economic development, seeing how they can help. One of the few things they tell me is, hey, Jorge, Puerto Rico has one of the highest effective tax rates out of all our markets. And I compete with other markets, you know, for, to be able to get capital and investment uh, for Puerto Rico. In the middle of Hurricane Maria, there was a special tax policy uh, which told us that if you brought assets to Puerto Rico, uh, and you took them out again, only temporarily, you could get a tax break. I think I was the opposite. You should have told us, hey, if you keep them in Puerto Rico uh, and you're strengthening your network, then we'll give you a tax uh, a incentive. So it's one of the areas where I think we need to work together with the government to see who we can pick and we can attract more investment, like Esteban says. And actually, the companies that are investing here, you know, uh, provide for further investment down the road. And then another one that I know everybody will talk about, but we're still pretty much at the same place we were in Maria in terms of electrical infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, I find out, I think telecommunications is an essential service and everybody would agree with that. Uh, I learn uh, what's happening with uh, outages, looking at the media, just like any other customer. Uh, we unfortunately still don't have communication. We're still not treated you know, as a priority uh, to get telecommunications to hospitals, to everybody out there. So it's one area where I think we, we need to work together uh, to make sure that we can all progress. Uh, and then lastly, we'll see, we, we'll, we're continuing investment in Puerto Rico. Again, the highest percentage of a 5G uh, developed market is Puerto Rico, I'm proud to say. And we're only beginning our, our level of investments. We wanna make sure that we turn Puerto Rico into a hub for technology and innovation uh, and all the impact that that will have in society in general here. So again, proud to be part of this panel and I'll turn it back to you, Representative Saldu. Thank you, Mr. Martel, for uh, such an in-depth look at the telecommunications in Puerto Rico. We know now more than ever with the coronavirus, uh, we have folks distance learning, so many young people, and how important access to internet is, how important 5G is to keep them competitive and for small businesses to thrive. And during disasters, we learned uh, all too well the importance of communication. And that's why Congresswoman Velasquez and I, Serrano, uh, Ocasio-Cortez and others fought for changes to the Stafford Act to be able to build back uh, our grid better. Uh, in, uh, and that continues to be a fight with the Trump administration right now. And then taxes continue to also be a issue. Uh, I don't know how many times Nidhi and I and others have uh, pleaded with the Ways and Means Committee uh, of, uh, over reforms uh, that uh, Chairman Neal has been strong to help, help us with, as well as Representative Murphy. Um, but the Senate, it's been a tough uh, fight with them over a lot of these issues. So we encourage industry to join with the, the House uh, to continue to pursue these uh, better tax policy in Puerto Rico. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Miguel Soto Clas, uh, the president of the Center for a New Economy. Miguel, thank you for being here. Uh, the question uh, for today is everything from computers to phones depend on telecommunications, but are fueled by electricity. Can you speak to the role of Puerto Rico's electrical grid in attracting high-tech companies and supporting its people at this time? First of all, thank you to the uh, Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. 
with these distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you for their leadership and uh, for Marco Davis and his invitation. You're completely right about the uh, power supply in Puerto Rico, uh, probably one of our most important challenges right now. And let me put that in a little bit of context for you. I think uh, you can't talk about Puerto Rico without talking about a little bit of history in terms of its economics. Uh, we have been in a, not a recession, a depression really, for over a decade of time, even before Maria came to our shores. Uh, and we are undergoing a, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the United States at the same time. We have had huge migration leaving Puerto Rico uh, and just a massive amount of job loss over that same amount of time. So these are what I call the comorbidities in Puerto Rico, our pre-existing uh, conditions. Uh, Puerto Rico does not come into Maria or the earthquakes or the pandemic as any other uh, jurisdiction or state or country. Uh, we have these very profound uh, comorbidities. And what I worry about is the long-term effects of these things. So these are not situations that if by a miracle we were to fix tomorrow, uh, they'd be gone. Uh, these are situations that have long-lasting, lifelong effects. We're talking about education. Uh, a child or a young person that's out of school, even just for a couple of weeks, that has an impact over their lifetime in terms of earnings and in terms of, of their mental health. So imagine what has happened in Puerto Rico, a system that wasn't great to begin with, and then has now some kids have, have had very little school, if any, since March of last year. We're talking about the lifetime effects of unemployment. Someone that has been unemployed even for just a month or two has lifetime effects. Imagine what it must be like for people that have been unemployed in Puerto Rico for years. Uh, the hunger situation that is occurring now, which is just so surprising to me and so worrying to me. We're no longer talking about people that uh, are unable to uh, make ends meet. We're talking about families that are going hungry because of economics, but also because of, of logistics and the, and the supply chain. Uh, and then health. You know, we've seen the collapse of Puerto Rico's uh, health department. Uh, unable to deal with this pandemic uh, and imagine the lifelong effects that that is going to have uh, on people. So I think this kind of highlights the reason why, going back to something that uh, Congresswoman Velasquez mentioned, it highlights the fact of why these reconstruction funds are so important for Puerto Rico. So we are not Norway, we are not Sweden. Uh, we are not a place where we were uh, in a very good situation and so we're going to bounce back. We were in a very deep hole and so these reconstruction funds are incredibly important for Puerto Rico. And to have them be uh, so slowly given out has caused traumatic effects on the island and that continues to happen. And let me say this, uh, nobody wants good oversight in Puerto Rico more than Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans are the ones that want to make sure that these funds are used well. So we welcome all the oversight in the world. What we don't want is punishment disguised as oversight. And a lot of what we're seeing is that from many uh, in the administration uh, and some in Congress. And I know that some of our esteemed colleagues in, these, in this panel have, have fought a lot against that. But what we've also seen, unfortunately, is even the funds that get to Puerto Rico are not spent. So it is very difficult for us sometimes to continue to fight for Puerto Rico and to say we've got to get these funds down here. And then when we do finally get some, to have our local government be unable and incapacitated to actually spend those funds in a correct way, uh, given all the needs that, that Puerto Rico has. Uh, so I think it's incredibly important to keep that in mind, and, to, and I'll finish answering your original question about the uh, about the power 
sector here in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it, it is one of the major challenges that we have. It is uh, the power company is now undergoing a privatization process, but Puerto Rico has uh, some of the most expensive uh, energy and electricity in the world, and at the same time, the most unreliable. We have a monopoly in Puerto Rico that somehow uh, was able to get itself bankrupt, you know, something that uh, uh, is almost impossible to fathom. If you're a monopoly with every right under law to recuperate all your expenses, how do you go bankrupt? Well, they, they figured out a way. And so uh, you can't have industry uh, without that. You can't have commerce without that. And, but that also affects communities. And Puerto Rico is a place with abundant sun. We should have been moving into renewables a long time ago, but this monopoly uh, has really stood against that. And so a lot of what we're working with now is, is trying to move in, in those directions. Uh, and so what's, what is the responsibility of Congress in, in, in all this? Uh, I think Congress, and I'll finish with this, has an incredible responsibility towards Puerto Rico because we are in a subordinate condition uh, to Congress. Uh, we are not a state. We don't have the representatives. And so Congresswoman Velasquez uh, and, and Congressman Soto uh, and Luis Gutierrez before them were a while, a, a while back, you know, they were the ones that represented us. Uh, but I think Congress in its entirety has a big, big responsibility to Puerto Rico. Not to take uh, our own responsibilities away. We have a big responsibility as Puerto Ricans ourselves not to be dependent on anybody else, uh, but we're not at an equal playing field right now. And until we are, uh, we are going to need to have that partnership uh, with Congress. Thank you so much, Mr. Soto Class, for uh, that incredible testimony on the barriers uh, to disaster relief and, and energy in general, the discussion there. Uh, we know, and it's been discussed many times, that less than half the $42 billion we allocated uh, has gotten down to the island. And I want to particularly point out an issue that Congresswoman Velasquez and I have worked on quite a bit, which is there's nearly $2 billion that's supposed to come down to the Department of Energy and HUD to help upgrade the energy system down there. It's been languishing for far too long. This would help with the 100% renewable energy by 2050 that the legislature down there has already uh, pushed for and passed into law. So the money's there. And it could be this terrible tragedy could at least give some opportunity by funding the ability to move to renewable energy. But we see an unwilling partner in the Trump administration. We had our last oversight meeting a year ago. That that grant still hasn't been awarded yet. And then when we talk about the disaster relief related to the earthquake, Nidia and I and Alexandria were in Nancy Pelosi's office earlier this year asking for funds for the earthquake, particularly for the schools. And, uh, and for long-term rebuilding. And we were pleased to be able to pass out nearly $5 billion out of the House. And there's been no work done in the Senate on this issue and nothing spoken by President Trump, even as schools down there, some of them may have structural issues. And then you talked about the unemployed in general and the issues with that that so many, both in Central Florida and across the nation are facing and uh, food uh, security, uh, Chairwoman Velasquez led on the NAP issue. We've worked together on the Medicare, uh, excuse me, the Medicaid parity issues. Uh, these are every day. We there is some other issue of inequality about Puerto Rico that, uh, particularly in funding that we face. Uh, so thanks for helping bring up those things. Uh, next, we're going to go to since you talked about the workers, and about uh, economic inequality. Uh, our next. Uh, panelist, uh, again, needs no introduction, a mentor of mine, Luis Gutierrez, who served 26 years in the Congress fighting the good fight. And you could tell he's still fighting the good fight for Puerto Rico because he's now moved down there. Uh, Congressman Gutierrez, thank you for being on the line. The question to you is income and wealth inequality uh, is the topic and, how, and poverty in Puerto Rico. How does a lack of reliable water, electricity, and internet affect Puerto Rico? How does it affect corruption? How does it manifest itself in Puerto Rico? These are really important questions uh, and really get to the worker people aspect of this. Uh, 
would love your thoughts. Thank you so much, Congressman Soto. Thank you for moderating um, this wonderful panel to the CHCI for reaching out and inviting me to my sister, because she is my sister, uh, Nidia Velasquez. Thank you for being our champion, our voice. And thank you to Darren for, for working with her. I'm, I read about what you guys do all the time here in Puerto Rico. And I can tell you from the people of Puerto Rico, we are so thankful that the two of you are in the Congress of the United States. Thank you, Nidia, and thank you, Darren. Number one. Number two, I agree with Miguel. Uh, he says it's a monopoly. It is a monopoly. But I'm going to use a word that because I think he's being kind. It's corruption. Let's let's be clear. Uh, they sold the tollways under the Fortunio administration, and now they're more expensive than ever. How are workers supposed to get to work? Well, Mr. Fortunio doesn't care because he got a multi-million dollar windfall because he got a seat on the very corporation that he sold the rights to the tollway to. Then they sold the airport to Mexican uh, investors. And everybody knows my love for the Mexican community, but not so for Mexican capitalist investors that come here. It's the most expensive food, and it is the most ex worst food. I mean, it's just, it is corruption once again. Every time I look at an issue here, Congressman Soto, I say, can you really trust, given the last two experiments in privatization, the airport, and the tollways, we need to be very cognizant. So I agree with Miguel, we don't want people to stop people uh, from oversight that's harmful, but come on. Germany now <laughs> provides solar energy, right? 30% of its capacity comes from solar. <laughs> Iowa, half of its energy comes from wind. We have more sun and more wind on the island of Puerto Rico, and yet we continue to use oil. What are we doing? on the island of Puerto Rico that we are so backwards. And it has. I'm happy to hear that Amgen is paying those wonderful salaries. But that's not the salary in Puerto Rico. The salary in Puerto Rico is $7.25, the minimum salary. Go almost everywhere you want. And you're going to find that that is truly the salary. I'm happy that at Amgen they're paying so much better. I wish I could say the rest of people that come to set up shop here in Puerto Rico. That's why Puerto Rico has half the per capita income of the poorest state, Mississippi. Huh? It starts with income inequality. And the fact is that we can do better. We can do better. There is absolutely no reason that Walmart should pay less than the $14.50 that Walmart pays the workers in Chicago, than the $15 that Walmart has to pay the workers in New Jersey and in New York the same salaries that they have to pay, but it's not only them. Home Depot does the same thing. Products that are more expensive, and yet salaries that are lower from the workers. Walgreens, uh, a corporation, which home is in the state of Illinois. These are the most profitable Walgreens, and yet their starting salary is $10 an hour. Most Puerto Ricans say, ay Luis, no te quejes, por lo menos son 10 dólares. But how, you still live in poverty at $10 an hour. How is it that a corporation like Walgreens can pay $15 in the city of Chicago to start a job as a cashier, but $10 for a part-time job here in, the, in, in, in Puerto Rico? So income inequality and the pervasiveness of corruption at every level of your life. I mean, I want people to come and invest here. And I think, um, as we heard from the representative from Emden, right, what do we need? We need water. Well, the water fails to arrive at my house on a monthly basis. So you can't rely on water in Puerto Rico. B, electricity, uh, you know, it's whenever they <laughs> wanna provide it. And it goes and it comes and it goes and it comes. And to telecommunication, I don't know how the state legislature here in Puerto Rico allows for there not to be more competition. Liberty Cable, which is the primary institution that provides you with your, um, with your uh, telecommunications here, your cable and your internet, it also stops working equal to the water and to the electricity. And everybody that lives on the island of Puerto Rico knows those things. So we also have to make sure that we uh, look at, I mean, there is systemic racism in the United States and there's systemic 
corruption on the island of Puerto Rico, or someone would have done something about an expensive telecommunication system that has uh, um, a relationship with the government of Puerto Rico, which is Liberty Cable. So this is my phone, uh, just for my friend from Liberty Cable. It's a, it's, I mean, my friend from T-Mobile, it's a T-Mobile phone. Well, I pay uh, T-Mobile an extra $15 a month so that my hotspot has, is more, has more power to it, right? Guess what? When the electricity goes out in Puerto Rico, which is when I need this hotspot, it doesn't work because this T-Mobile is tied to the electrical grid of Puerto Rico and the communications and the towers that that electrical grid provides to. So I would say, look, I'm gonna end with this. We need to continue to fight for this island. Lastly, yes, we have an administration in Washington, D.C., a president that said, oh, those Puerto Ricans, that's a dirty, poor country. Why don't we just sell it? Why don't we trade it for Greenland? And after Hurricane Maria, he said, ah, you know what? They want the government to do everything. He basically called us lazy. You want to know something? I say what Nidia says. The only people I saw, and I arrived here, I know Nidia got here a couple of days after Hurricane Maria. I arrived here nine days after Hurricane Maria. You know who I saw on the street? Puerto Rican doctors. Puerto Rican policemen, Puerto Rican firemen, Puerto Rican electrical workers working out there. Our Puerto Rican community was the first line of defense for our people. So let's continue to work on this and let's continue to also say, stop the stranglehold of the Jones Act. Why is it that everything costs more in Puerto Rico? Because we need to subsidize the merchant Marines of the United States of America. $500 million a year out of the pockets of the consumers of Puerto Rico. Let's end that travesty. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Congressman Gutierrez, for your passion and your leadership. Uh, we appreciate you speaking on behalf of El Pueblo in Puerto Rico. Uh, we've been given a couple of questions from the audience. And uh, so let's start with uh, something along those lines. Uh, Amanda Crespo asks, how would you prioritize infrastructure investment in Puerto Rico, such as creating programs and policies that prevent homes from collapsing in another natural disaster? And we're going to give this first question to both Chairwoman Velasquez and Mr. Soto Class uh, for your input. Well, I would say that there are two areas uh, where Puerto Rico uh, and the Puerto Rican government should focus on, and that is business formation that is Puerto Rican, that is owned by Puerto Ricans to serve Puerto Ricans. The problem that Puerto Rico has is they need to uh, work on a, an economic model that, that, that represents the reality of Puerto Rico that works for the people of Puerto Rico. And um, so, you know, if we're gonna depend on policies coming out of Washington, well, we incentivize, we provide tax credit, we give them to, the, to Puerto Rico, and then when we need to balance the budget here, we take them away. And a good use of the federal resources that have been appropriated. And yes, we have been fighting to make sure that that money gets to Puerto Rico because that was the intent of the government. And it is morally wrong for this administration and for this president to use um, the money that has been appropriated as a, to, to, to put roadblocks so that Puerto Rico doesn't get the money as a way to punish um, whatever expression of uh, outrage was expressed by uh, Alcalde de San Juan. So Puerto Rico needs to use the money that has been appropriated to rebuild Puerto Rico, to um, uh, build new homes and new houses and rebuild those that were damaged. Um, there is no way that the government of Puerto Rico can justify having money in their coffers and not putting that money to work on behalf of the people of Puerto Rico. We need to incentivize business formation. We need to strengthen access to capital in Puerto Rico and technical assistance for those small businesses that are the ones that create the jobs 
for the people of Puerto Rico to be able to flourish and to expand and, and to be strong and to create the jobs that the people of Puerto Rico need. It's a, Thank a you, great Chief. question. And Mr. Sinto, great question please. And, uh, and a great answer from, from, from the Congresswoman. I agree 100%. I would only add two small things. Uh, one is very important, uh, and I know uh, Congresswoman Velasquez has worked a lot on this as well. Our research found that uh, only less than 10% of the work and the contracts uh, for reconstruction are going to Puerto Rican firms. Over 90% is going to foreign firms. Uh, there's no way that you are going to have local economic development uh, if this is allowed to, to continue. Uh, there are businesses and there are companies and there's capacity uh, in Puerto Rico uh, to undertake uh, this work. Uh, and the second thing I would say is you're not going to get very far uh, until we stop the austerity regime that has been imposed uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing now in terms of our health department being unable to deal with the pandemic and what we've seen with our housing department after Maria being unable to deal with the hurricane is because uh, they were basically wiped out by austerity. Austerity is basically, hey, let's strip the government down to its minimum, uh, to its bones. Uh, and the problem with that is that when you have a situation like Maria or the COVID pandemic, you have nobody in government to do the things that need to get done. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Our next question is going to be to Mr. Santos and Mr. Martel. Then we're going to end with a question to Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, to Mr. Santos and Martel, how can corporations who make investments in the island ensure their operations are carried out with Puerto Ricans in mind? And we'll start with Mr. Santos and go to Mr. Martel. Sure. Uh, well, I, I can tell you how uh, my uh, company does, and certainly how many companies that I know are doing in Puerto Rico. But the reality is that you know, we do employ a, a, the vast majority of our staff are Puerto Ricans on our operation, uh, whether they're direct labor, whether they're scientists and the engineers. And to be able to do that, we have worked very closely with the universities in Puerto Rico to ensure that we have the talent available with the expertise necessary to ensure that our operations are uh, successful. So uh, how do we ensure that as companies invest their talent? Well, companies need to collaborate with industry to create that ecosystem that I mentioned to ensure that the talent is available to continue to advance uh, the highly complex work that companies like Amgen uh, do on the island. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Mr. Martel. Uh, well, we have a whole structure here. All of our management is from Puerto Rico, including myself, uh, finance, marketing, sales, engineering, todo boricua. Uh, so we actually tailored you know, our product and service to the Puerto Rican market. To give you an idea, services and products in Puerto Rico in many areas are actually more accessible cheaper than the ones that would be mainland uh, in that sense. That's because you have people looking out for the market uh, right here from Puerto Rico. It's the only market in all of T-Mobile that it's actually uh, handled this way and structured uh, this way. I'll add two quick things. Uh, uh, first of all, we want to go against and offer home internet, uh, Representative Gutierrez. We know what you're uh, going through. We believe it's a monopoly. And by the way, AT&T is leaving Puerto Rico while we're doubling down. So that's an area that we're investing in a network because we want to go aggressively uh, around that area. And yes, uh, unfortunately, we do depend on uh, electrical uh, power. To give you an idea, in Maria, we once had 8,000 gallons of diesel a day uh, to keep our network uh, going on. But it's very, very hard with such a deficient uh, electrical grid, you know, to continue the whole network uh, up. To give you an idea, we have 10 times on average more outages than the average in the United States and other markets. We'll continue investing. We have a solid investment now in having generators and every single cell phone. But it's an added cost that we have in Puerto Rico just to make up you know, for a faulty infrastructure. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Martel. And that question was from Kim. This last question is going to go to Representative Gutierrez from Jacqueline Alvarado. And since you talked about power to the people, both symbolically and literally with, uh, with uh, renewable energy and, and, and the power issues down there, uh, Jacqueline Alvarado asks, what policies and investments will be made to ensure environmental sustainability in Puerto Rico? And I really think this could be the, a, a long-term benefit for, on so many levels. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez. That's where I think Congressman Soto and Congresswoman Velasquez, we need you to be our champions and our voice. 
as they restructure the electrical system here in Puerto Rico. We cannot rely on the local entities to structure it so that we have a modern, viable electrical grid in Puerto Rico that uses the sun and the wind and those things that are God given to this beautiful tropical island of Puerto Rico. And I would just like to just add one last thing. You know, Amgen is be a able to come to Puerto Rico because they have the talent here in Puerto Rico. But unfortunately, this administration that we currently have continues to disinvest in the University of Puerto Rico. Less money, fewer classes, fewer classrooms, fewer institutions. How can you take a first class educational system and destroy it and expect to prepare a population for jobs of the future and jobs that pay well? So once again, I just want to say I love when I read about Unidia here in the papers and listen to you on the radio and the same thing for you, Darren. Uh, you guys just bring light uh, to the darkness that exists many times on this beautiful island that I love and that I know everybody on this panel loves dearly. Thank you, Congressman, for your passion and your leadership. Thank you to Mr. Soto class, Mr. Santos and Mr. Martel for your perspectives from both industry and the nonprofit arena. Thank you to Chairwoman Velasquez for your continued leadership and inspiration. I know we didn't talk as much about other areas such as agriculture, which I think there's going to be a lot of growth in, uh, as well as uh, in uh, in tech and other areas like tourism. Uh, those will be for another time. Thank you to our audience from home for participating and submitting such great questions. And uh, we encourage you to attend sessions for the rest of today and this week. Please keep tweeting about the conference at hashtag CHCIHA, excuse me, hashtag CHCIHHM20. If you know people who would be interested in the conference but haven't signed up yet, encourage them to go to www.chcihhm.org. And finally, we'd love it if you would attend our gala celebration this coming Monday evening, September 21st from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Go to the same conference website, click on the gala tab, and you'll have your register. Uh, you'll have to register separately. Thank you all particularly our panelists uh, and to representatives Velasquez and Gutierrez and enjoy the conference. Thank you everybody for supporting the I and that concludes your session. Thank today. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Soto.